Welcome to the Life Worship Center broadcast, 1604 Golden Springs Road. For more information about our church, visit us on the web at lifewc.org. And now, today's sermon. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. <laughs> and he's just the same as his holy name. That's right. That's the reason why I love him so. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And there's no other like him. There is no other. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you and to worship you on a Wednesday night. God, yes, I'm sure there are people that are tired, distracted, whatever. But in your presence, God, things just seem to melt away, break off, fall off. And we just enjoy your presence. We are renewed, refreshed. We are strengthened and encouraged. And Things just change when we're in your presence. God, prepare our hearts to hear your word tonight, to receive it. I pray that we just wouldn't let anything hinder, distract, or discourage us from receiving your word. For it is holy, it is living, it is powerful, and we're ready to receive it in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Amen. We're, we have been in a Wednesday night series called Read Me. Read Me. And what we've been doing is we've been breaking down some popular scriptures. We've been using scriptures that if you've been in church for three months probably, you've heard these scriptures before. So it's not new scriptures, but they are scriptures that have life in them and the purpose, or I hope, I hope the, the results of this is to get you interested, if you're not, in the Word of God and a deeper study into the Word of God. And so tonight we're in one of my favorite passages in the Bible, a passage that's very common, uh, very popular. Most of you have heard this passage. It's found in Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17. I have some notes. Hopefully you were given some notes. If you don't have notes and you need notes, raise your hand. Does everybody have notes that wants notes? we got somebody in the back here. Dad, can you grab them from the front? Dad will get you some notes. Appreciate that very much. And so if you want to take notes, the answers are not going to be on the screens. The answers, you're going to get them by what? Listening. you got to listen. If you don't listen, you're not going to get it. So if your neighbor asks you what I just said, what are you going to tell them? You should have been listening. All right. <laughs> and then give them the answer. Right? We want to show them grace, but we've got to tell them the truth. They weren't listening. It's time to listen. Isaiah, raise your hand if you don't have notes. Here's the guy with the notes. Michael had his hand up. He won't raise it now, but he's up. we got some over here. I think, yeah, you got some over here too. Y'all just keep your hands up till he gets to you. He'll get there. Isaiah 54 and 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me says the Lord. Somebody say amen to that. So he starts off with no weapon formed against you will prosper. I'm going to put this in three divisions. No weapon formed against you shall prosper is division one. Number two will be every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. And then number three is going to be this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me. And so no weapon formed against you will prosper. And so I started thinking about weapons. And there are all kinds of different weapons. Some weapons that we have today physically 
or in war or in combat are the same as they were a thousand years ago. There's some things that are the same. And then there's some things that are new. There's new weapons. There's technology and things like that. We have a very, uh, I don't know what you call it, complicated weaponry. But you know, the enemy, he has weapons that he's been using for quite some time against people. And the fact that he has weapons... And the fact that God would say no weapon formed against you tells us that Satan is committed in his attack against you. It is not half-hearted. It is not just something he does in his pastime. He is committed to steal, kill, and destroy. He's committed to it. And so much that he has weapons that he forms against you. Ephesians 6 and 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that word wiles means deceit, craft, trickery. I think about the wily coyote. Y'all remember him? Wily coyote. He had all of these. Our younger people don't know who that is, but older people do. He had all these different boxes that he got from the Acme company. And they had different kind of contraptions and devices. It was his scheme to catch who? The roadrunner, right? And so that word wily is sort of where we are tonight. When the Bible says that there are wiles of the devil. He's got tricks. He's got schemes. But here's what you need to know, because we're going to just narrow it down to just a a few specific tactics that he uses. Every weapon of the devil is fashioned and fueled by lies. Lies are at the root, the foundation of what he does. Nothing comes out of his mouth that is not deceptive, that is not a lie. And Jesus understands this. And I think it's interesting, if you'll look at Jesus in the Gospels, he dealt with the enemy many times in the same way. And just take one, for instance, in Mark chapter 1, verse 23, it says, There was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, And he cried out saying, let us alone, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. And if you'll pay attention, Jesus often relayed to the enemy those words, be quiet. Close your mouth. I'm not lit. It's time for you to stop talking. I, even though the enemy was saying, You are the Son of God. You are Jesus. You are the Messiah. You can, you can cast us out. Jesus said, Shut up. Shut up. Just hush. Because deception and lies are at the root of who he is. You need to understand that. The Bible says no weapon formed, it's fashioned, it's made. In other words, the devil has weapons that are custom made for you. Weapons that are custom made for you. Hebrews 12 and 1. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. There's weapons that he custom makes for you. He's got a toolbox for Neil and Matthew, right? And Kay. He's got a toolbox for you guys. And they're custom made for you. There's some things in his toolbox that he can bring out and he can come and it will just turn you upside down if you're not walking in the Spirit. 
If you're not ready and prepared, and that same thing may be brought against me or Lowell over here, and it doesn't even phase. But he's got a toolbox for him, and he's got a toolbox for me. And so they're custom made, and that's why Scripture says, let's strip off those things that slow us down, and especially those sins that easily trip us up. And here's the three weapons of the enemy. And there's so much more, but we're going to narrow them down into three categories. The first one is deception. Let me back up and help you with some fill in the blanks here. Three weapons of the enemy that he uses often are deception, discouragement, and doubt. Deception, discouragement, and doubt. Deception. The first time we're introduced to the devil in the Bible, he comes in as a deceiver. The Bible says that the serpent was more subtle than anything else there was. He came in deceiving. He came in with deception. He came in twisting the truth, giving you just enough that it sounded like what God was saying, but twisting it enough that it turned it around into something else, deceptive. You see, the enemy will use deception against me, but the word will silence him. And that's so important to know, that when the enemy brings deception, the word of God will silence him. Three times in the wilderness, the enemy tried to bring against Jesus to tempt him in the wilderness. And he sort of twisted the words of God. But you can't twist the words of God and deceive The Word of God. Amen. So Jesus brought back to him the Word of God. The true Word of God. And so what it teaches us is that if I'm not a student of the Word of God. And you say, well, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a leader. I want you to hear me. If I'm not a student of the Word of God, I'm vulnerable to deception from the enemy. I'm vulnerable to it. But if I'm a student of the Word of God and I'm in the Word of God, and I'm learning the Word of God for myself, at my level, wherever that may be, then I'm more equipped and readily equipped for when the enemy comes in to deceive me, I can silence him with thus saith the Lord God. Understand? You need some verses. You know the toolbox. Come on, you know the toolbox Satan has for you. All of you do, unless you've been a Christian. You, by now, you, how many people have been a Christian more than 10 years? Raise your hand. Several. All, right. All of you that raised your hand, you know what the toolbox is that the enemy uses against you. Traffic. People on your job. The computer. Potato chips, Walmart. Don't make Beverly snort now. She's we got. <laughs> you know what it is. So what you need to do is you need to get some scriptures that silence the devil when it comes to his toolbox against you. So you be specific in your counterattack. When he brings out the weapons that he uses to easily trip you up. Do you hear what I'm saying? So if you're not a student of the word, you're vulnerable to his attacks. Okay, how long you've been in church, you're vulnerable. All right, the second was discouragement. The enemy has many ways to discourage. But I am encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Here's how you prove it. How many times have you come in on a Wednesday night? Or a Sunday morning and you're discouraged. You've had a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, a bad year, a bad life, whatever. And you come in and God begins to move. And a song, it's like God is just calling you out and speaking to you. And all of a sudden, your heart melts and you're encouraged. And you had hope that you didn't have before you came. You know what that is? That is the Holy Spirit. That's what He came to do. He came to comfort He's a comforter. God wasn't saying he's sending you a blanket when he said comforter. 
He said, I'm sending you somebody that will comfort you, encourage you, lead you, guide you, support you, cheer you up, strengthen you, kick you in the seat of the pants if you need it, help you out. God says, I'm sending somebody that will help you. And so when the enemy comes to discourage, we can be encouraged by the Holy Spirit. And you say, what if it's on Tuesday when I'm discouraged? Then you just do what we do at church on Wednesday. Get you some praise music going or do it like the Church of Christ and just sing a cappella. The Holy Spirit works with or without music, y'all. It, 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 with or without music. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. The third one is doubt. The enemy man... He will bring doubt into your picture. He will show you every single reason not to believe God. <laughs> he will say, look at the news. He will say, look at that book. He'll say, look what that person just said on Facebook. He'll say, look at your bank statement. <laughs> He'll say, look at the gas hand on your car. <laughs> He'll use every scenario, you know, every possible scenario. We got to understand that's his job. That's what he does. Every possible scenario he can to make you doubt. Doubt that you're making a difference. Doubt that you can come out of the hole that you're in. Doubt that God loves you. Doubt that God's word about you. Doubt, doubt that God's promises for you is true. Everything he can do to bring doubt, he will do it. And he's really good at it. He's really good at it. And he will make God's people doubt if we're not ready. The enemy will try to cause me to doubt. But I have a shield called faith. A shield called faith that will quench every fiery dart of the enemy. Amen? Amen. So every reason he gives me, I got a shield that deflects it. And I say, I trust God. <laughs> no matter what my eyes see or my ears hear or my fingers feel or my mind thinks or my emotions sense, I trust God. And that's a shield. That means I ain't listening to you. I got a shield up. And I believe God more than I believe you. I believe God more than I believe the news. I believe God more than I believe my neighbor. I believe God. Basically, every weapon the enemy uses is found under these categories of deception, discouragement, and doubt. But the Bible tells us in our scripture tonight that no weapon formed against me shall prosper you know what the word prosper means I know if you watch much Christian television it means you got a Cadillac and lots of money but to prosper means to prevail to succeed He says, no weapon formed, fashioned, custom made for you is going to succeed, is going to prevail. Isn't that good news? And that's the best news ever. All those things we just talked about, the things he does to deceive me, the things he does to discourage me, and the things he does to cause me to doubt, they will not succeed, they will not prevail. And when he says no weapon, that's what he means. He means no weapon. He doesn't mean most weapons. He doesn't mean almost all weapons. He means no weapons. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is there is no good reason for me to live in defeat. There's no good reason for you to live in defeat. And you might say, Pastor, you won't believe how the devil's been attacking me this week and my family. And I may not believe it. 
And I may not be able to comprehend it, or I may not be able to tell you the answer, but what I can believe is I can tell you however he may be coming against you, I believe that his scheme will not succeed against you if you're a child of God. If you're a child of God, whatever tactics he's using, they will not prevail, they will not prosper, they will not be profitable, they will not come to any good, they will not succeed with whatever intent they may have. Let me help you get here. How many of you, because I'm just going to be honest with what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, that sounds good, but I don't know if I believe it. Because I feel like the weapons are working. (laughs) How many of you would believe this statement? Let me make this statement. No weapon formed against God will prosper. How many believes that? We don't have any problem with that, do we? Because we've just unattached ourselves from the situation. We believe God is the higher power. We believe that there is no other like Him. We believe that God, the weapons of the enemy, are not, they, they can, do not stand a chance. They will not prevail. They will not profit anything. They will not succeed with their purpose when it comes to God. Do you believe that? I believe that with all my heart. There's no problem with that. Well, listen to this. Because here's what we're going to bring you to. I want you to understand this. I'm going to tell you this. Then I'm going to show you this. An attack against me is an attack against God. Because we are in a covenant relationship. Come on, you got to get this. You have no problem believing that no weapon formed against him is going to prosper. You need to know that an attack against me is an attack against him. Because we are in a covenant relationship that was sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? I want you to think about that for just a minute. You see, what, we, what you may not know about Isaiah chapter 54 is this a scripture written to Israel... It was a scripture that was prophetic about the new covenant that was coming, which, by the way, we are walking in. But it was a scripture that defined or described a barren woman. And that woman was Israel. And what God is saying is God is saying to Israel, I am your husband. He says in Isaiah 54 and 5, your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name and your redeemer is the holy one of israel he is called the god of the whole earth and so when you understand that that god is saying you're my wife and i'm your husband then you can understand more clearly verse 17 when the husband says to his wife no weapon formed against you is going to prosper and anybody that talks about you is going to come back to them because I am yours and you're mine and this is your heritage and your righteousness is of me he says if they do it to you they've done it to me and they'll have to answer to me now do you understand and so now you got to believe. If you believe no weapon formed against him will prosper, then you got to believe no weapon formed against you. Amen. Amen. It's what Jesus was saying in John chapter 10, verse 28. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That's just good right there. That's just all there is to it. Any weapon that is fashioned for me will not prevail because I am in covenant with God. I am His bride. An attack against me is an attack against Him. Now, let's go back to what you said or what you were thinking when you were thinking, this all sounds good, but... I feel like his weapons against me are working pretty good right now. I feel beat down and beat up. I am discouraged. I do have doubt. I have been deceived. Listen to me. The weapons of the enemy may appear to be successful at times. But God has the last word. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I feel it so strongly. 
the weapons of the enemy may appear to be successful at times. But God has the last word. you feel beat up, broke down, discouraged, you are a child of God, I want you to hear me, God has the last word, God has the last word, every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you will condemn. That word condemn means refute. I want you to notice that it says you. Look at your neighbor and say it says you. (laughs) You're going to do it. You're going to do it. In other words, God is saying that we do have a part in this. There's going to be faith involved. There's also going to be obedience involved. Because if you read down to the last part of our scripture, this all happens for who? The servants of the Lord. But he says, every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you will refute. Now first off, that does not mean you go and put your finger in their face and refute them. Because that's a strategy some of, the, some of you have used and it didn't work. Amen? Let me tell you how you refute them. I will refute it with my silence through the power of the Spirit. One of the most valuable things for a Christian is silence. Silence. How many of you have ever done anything on Facebook that a day later you thought, I wish I had been silent. All of you afraid to raise your hands. Some of you are raising your hands. <laughs> Everybody should raise their hands. How many has ever confronted somebody at work or in your home? My little girl plays softball. Nine-year-old girls softball. There needs to be a lot of silence where there is none. Johnny? After our game last night, Coach looked at our parents as we gathered together. And he said, I want to thank y'all <laughs> for behaving tonight. <laughs> you wouldn't think you'd ever have to say that to a group of parents. But sometimes... There's words where there should be silence. Silence is so, I don't, I, there's a million scriptures in the Bible, not a million, but I'm, I'm exaggerating. There's a bunch of scriptures in, about silence in the Bible. Scriptures that say things like fools will talk out, fools will just blurt it out, but wise people will hold their mouth, hold their tongue. There's a scripture that says if a fool is silent, even he looks a little bit smarter. <laughs> so when you're flustered and you don't know what to say and you don't know how to respond and somebody's come against you and somebody's just laid it on heavy and they're challenging your faith and who you really are and who you say you are, zip it. Refute them by not responding. Oh, this is tough, ain't it? Isaiah 53 and 7. It's basically a tough after you hear this verse. He was oppressed, treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Why? He knew who he was. He knew he was doing God's work. He knew how it was going to end. So how can I refute those who rise against me with silence? I know who I am. I know I'm serving the Lord. I know how all this ends. 
I don't have to win my argument with you if I'm confident in who I am with him. Amen? When I'm attacked with words, I'll refrain from retaliation with silence. All right, let's look at the second way. I will refute it with my life through the power of the Spirit. When I'm attacked with words, and we're talking about the enemy accusations, the Scripture's actually almost uh, a metaphor of in a court and being accused. And surely if we were brought to a court without the blood of Jesus Christ, we could be accused. And, and the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. So that's sort of the scene here. But whether it be the enemy himself or people or situations, when I'm attacked with words, I will live my life with the strength of the Holy Spirit in a way that reveals the deceiver for who he is and God for who he is in me. Peter says it like this in chapter 2, verse 12. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. That's pretty powerful right there. How do we refute the accusations? We live the life that God intends for us to live. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me. Did I fill in all the blanks up to this point because I got a little bit carried away? Everybody's afraid to ask because I'm going to say you weren't listening. I know. This is the heritage. Say heritage. Of the servants of the Lord. Psalm 61 and 5 says, You, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Hmm. Colossians 1 and 12, He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. Two very good scriptures. Victory is my possession and my inheritance as a servant of the Lord. No matter where you are right now, you got to get this. I'm almost done. You can cheer up. But you got to get this. No matter where you are right now in your walk with the Lord, you're a son of God, a daughter of the Lord. Listen, victory, it's your possession. It's your inheritance. You're going to stand before God one day, as the book of Jude declares. You're going to be righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You're going to stand before the Father. And although the enemy would accuse you, Jesus is going to say, I paid it all. Victory is your possession. It is your inheritance. Oh, what an amazing thing that is. And so when you understand that it's yours, it's your inheritance, it's who you are, it's a possession that God has given you, that's why no weapon formed against you can prosper. Do you know all that? Man. I think this is probably your last blank here. I can stand righteously before the enemy withstanding his attacks because I am justified by the Lord Jesus how powerful is that you see this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness or vindication their justification is of me that is, it's probably the most important part of this verse, but it's probably the least remembered part. Everybody remembers no weapon formed against me, but not everybody remembers their righteousness is of me, or their vindication is of me, or their justification is of me. Basically what he's saying is, is me as a believer, I can stand up 
with boldness. I can stand up with courage and say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Even though I know I'm not perfect, even though I know there's failures in my past, even though I know, know that there's struggles, I know that there's sin that can easily beset me, even though I know that I'm fragile and I know that I need God every day just to exist, just to live, just to try to serve Him to the best of my ability, I can stand up bold and courageous and declare, no weapon formed against me shall prosper because I understand that His vindication, the righteousness, the justification that merits all of these promises is based on God. It's based on Him. And I'm His servant. The best way I know to say this is just to read a few verses for you. And I'm going to be quiet. If you want to come play a little music, please. I want to give somebody the opportunity if they need prayer tonight. I want you to listen to these verses. This says it better than I can say it. It sums it up. Romans 8 and 34 is where we're going to begin. Who then will condemn us? No one. Not any weapon. Not any person. No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours. Paul said that like he owned it. You know why? Because he did. And you can say it like you own it because it's your possession. It's your inherent. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life Neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord who declares over you no weapon formed against you shall prosper for this is your heritage own it look at your neighbor and say own that stand with me tonight if you need special prayer tonight for a situation for a person for yourself I want to pray for you tonight give you the opportunity as they lead us in something you can just play, sing, whatever let's just be focused upon the Lord for the next few moments we are in His presence His word has been spoken let's just let it sink in let's let it sink in thank you Jesus thank you Jesus you know I'm reminded of the scripture in the Bible where Jesus talks about the seed that is sown and the seed is the word of God and it lands on different types of soil and so God can give a good word like he's given tonight if you're not careful the enemy can come and snatch it away or if there's a bunch of weeds a bunch of weeds and overgrowth in your heart it just, it's not going to, it's not going to, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. Or if your heart is chasing after something else and the ground is stony, you might receive it with gladness and it shoot up real quick, but then it's going to wither away once there's any kind of adversity or trial. And so can we take just two, three minutes right here and just ask the Lord, God, prepare my heart. Break up that fallow ground. Break up the hard ground. Make my heart good and tender, ready, receptive to receive from you, to be changed by you. God, I want to take this word and 
own it. It's mine. It's for me. I receive it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I was asked to pray for a prayer cloth for Blake Turner's grandmother. So, Pastor April, if you want to come. I don't know her name. The Lord does. Help me pray tonight. Father, we come before you. You know her need. You know what she's facing. Lord, whether it be a physical need, whatever it may be, we just ask you to move in Jesus' name. Change this situation. Thank you for favor. Thank you, Jesus. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Oh, we, we give you glory. We give you glory. We praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can take it. Wait. You can remind me after service. Anyone else need special prayer? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.